Can everybody hear me? Great. Well, my name is Michelle, and I am here to talk to you about that new design smell. That's why I was invited here, and uh, I think what was noted, too, was a bit of the editorial model and the open source dynamics around how the magazine works. So I will talk about that. What I'm also going to talk about is two more projects, because I think they're going to really help round out what I mean by open source. So the other project I'll be talking about is, uh, it's actually an annual report that was commissioned uh, from the VPRO, which is a Dutch public broadcaster. And then the third project will be um, a social network and a publishing platform called Mediamatic Travel. So um, one thing I'll just say quickly about what I mean by open source is this kind of traditional way of developing software. And what I mean by that is just basically that the uh, source code has be, been opened up and is freely available to use under an open license. And uh, sometimes something people that then take and kind of update or change and that sort of thing. So I kind of mean it in that way. I mean it in a very traditional way. And then the other way that I mean it is a bit more philosophical. So it's more about open source spirit, which is more about um, the way in which materials are crowdsourced or how um, some materials are collected, as in they are just found. So um, one thing I, I did want to mention before I get into uh, the gist of more of it was that I don't want to kind of come here and abuse uh, a buzzword. I'm not here to torture people into uh, misunderstanding what I'm talking about and uh, I'm not here to kind of uh, proclaim that I'm representing another digital revolution and that sort of thing. So I'm really here to question uh, the words, like the very words that I use to describe what it is that I do. So this is kind of, um, you know, this is the buzz. Uh, you will see a great mix of things in here, and uh, the word open is used in such a large variety of ways that uh, it can often be either misunderstood or misattributed. We've got, like, people trying to um, you know, redistribute like open data and developing new modes of like opening up governments and how do we access that data and to what purpose is it put. Then we also have uh, these other ideas like um, different modes of filmmaking for open source festivals. We have uh, Open Design Now, which is a book that covers like a, a zillion different ways in which open source is used. It's very, very broad. It ranges from like some object you can scratch uh, right, and um, then we have like other things where there are festivals uh, in Rotterdam where all this open source code is being used to do these kind of light shows on city buildings and and then I also just noticed that there's a magazine that's come out of New York or I'm not sure if it still comes out but it was called Open City and it kind of didn't really have much to do with that it just meant that they wanted to explore notions of art and urbanism in new ways and so here are like 50 million different ways that you could understand what is meant by open. And um, I think that the best way to kind of show how confusing it can be is to show what I thought was kind of the epitome of the, 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 the buzz around it. And um, this was a, a conference in Barcelona. It was also a series of events and all sorts of things. And I came across an interview with one of the organizers uh, of the festival. And um, I'm just going to give you like a snapshot of a, a few of the things that this person was saying. So uh, here it comes. <laughs> this is like the avalanche of digital and social stuff that have impacted pretty much everything. Economy, politics, art, design, la, la, la. And then there's like this idea of, you know, open source. And then there are words like thrown in like collaboration, sharing and co-creation and delocalization. And then... We've got that cute little like 90s idea of the web, right? That network culture, which is still around. And then we've got like how that has affected all these other different fields and it goes and goes and goes. And then all of a sudden it comes down to some weird like idea around um, developing nations and remodeling manufacturing. So we've got like the reuse and optimization of materials and uh, making things accessible and delocalizing production. And like it just, ah, <laughs> it just kind of goes all over the place. So. 
this is not necessarily like a critique of those activities. This is really just trying to figure out like what, what does it mean? Like what in the world uh, does that possibly mean? And a lot of the stuff around it um, is about this cute, soft idea of what open means, right? It just, people assume that it's good and positive and pro-democracy and all these sorts of things. Um, the argument I'm going to make in my talk today and the projects that I'll be showing you is basically an argument for, for like smart gatekeeping within open source. I think there's a lot of buzz around the idea that there will be no gatekeepers anymore and that there is no such thing as knowledge or authority. And I'm going to argue for some. Um, so I'm going to argue for that within open source dynamics. And I guess it's not because, you know, it's not also just this clear cut thing where you can imagine, uh, oh, you know, yesterday was closed and today is open. And it's not as if this has just kind of like been transitioning uh, smoothly or clearly. And um, so I'm not here to argue that, you know, um, things should be open or closed. I'm kind of saying they're always a bit of both. And let's talk about that. And I think that this is all happening because, um, you know, there are some very pretty dramatic media changes and uh, social and financial dynamics that have changed over time as well. So, uh, and I think that some of those uh, manifestations are, are pretty unique. Um, I think that at the center of this manifestation is the idea that the internet has some sort of like essential nature to it. Right? It's this like magical creature that has this innate emancipatory and pro-democratic capacity for revolution within it. It's like this is just assumed as being true and it is good. And um, it's also, you know, just because of an information technology explosion that we've seen since the 60s. And also some of the uh, digital technology emerging that we've seen in the 90s. So I think there are different ways of talking about those manifestations and about the argument that I'm making that there's room for gatekeeping still. And um, I think that there are many different ways I could go about talking to you about that argument. I think that um, one of my favorite ways to, to start is to question the words that we, we use. And so I'm gonna try to think about what open means. And I begin this question because as you saw, there's like a huge confusion around it and there's, there's, there's that buzz factor. So, um, the first thing I'm going to try to kind of grasp is just um, what open doesn't mean or what it typically is confused with. Um, there's this idea that I think this festival was a, a project was a, a great example of. There's this idea that, uh, that openness means that there's just this automatically good network of creativity, period. And um, what I'm really fascinated by is this idea of like, uh, the, the network that, you know, the network was this kind of cute idea that we had in the 90s of like bringing humanity together into a single network of collaboration. And um, I think that what I'm actually seeing emerging more and more and more is stuff like this, which is the like overly customization of everything. So, and I don't know if you've been reading about this uh, in the papers, but we're seeing more and more the fact that like not a single person sees the same internet anymore. Every person's phone has a different setting to it. Every like autonomous search result is like constantly changing all your, your, your search results. And um, so what we're seeing more and more, and this is kind of a term that was coined by uh, Evgeny Morozov, who's a technology critic, is that what we're seeing is actually billions of internets. There's like one internet per person more and more. So it's actually like shifting slowly away from this idea um, of the network. And I have this really weird quote here by David Weinberger, who's at the Harvard Berkman Center. And he, he, he still kind of likes to peddle this uh, cute network idea, which is that knowledge now lives not just in libraries and museums and academic journals. It now lives not just in the skulls of individuals. Our skulls and our institutions are simply not big enough to continue collecting knowledge. Knowledge is now not a property of persons, but of the network. And so there's this big idea of the network out there and it's very strong. And what we're actually seeing today though is like a move away from that. Uh, another thing that uh, I think is pretty 
easy to question, but I, I don't know. There's uh, this idea that the internet is just like automatically going to democratize everything, and uh, you know every tyrant is going to be taken down by Twitter and, and that sort of thing. Um, this is, uh, you know, it's it's not to say that it it it, it doesn't. It's just that it, it's not like a guarantee and it's not automatic. And so, what do we mean by that? Um, this is a website that was launched by the, the Thai government. It's called Protect the King. And so people usually assume that like strange dictators around the world, that they're not really in tune with the internet. Uh, but actually more and more of them are, and they use it in ways that are not necessarily always pro-democratic. Um, the Protect the King website is where Thai citizens can come to the website and rat out their neighbors that have been like talking shit about the king last night over dinner. And then as you can see, there are like real life arrests occurring around this. So uh, it's not to say that the internet can't be used for pro-democratic activities, but uh, it is equally used for anti-democratic activities. And then the last thing I'm just gonna say about what I think maybe open uh, is not is, uh, I don't think it's new. It's quite uh, an old thing, and anyone who knows anything about universities throughout Europe during the medieval ages knows about um, how crowdsourcing worked, for example. Um, this is the Smithsonian Institute, and uh, it's just like a really clear-cut example. Um, in 1849, they began a crowdsourcing project where they uh, sought out uh, 600 volunteers around the world, and they... Uh, were coming from like 12 different countries and um, 16 other kind of like territories. Uh, so there were quite a few of them and they were all responsible for submitting different weather reports and they were all collected into this um, publication, this compilation of climatic data uh, that they then published in 1861. So, um, and I think even stuff like Yelp, you know, Yelp is often hailed as an app that will crowdsource uh, what people think about uh, restaurants and that sort of thing. But even like Zagat was even like a predecessor to that. Um, there are millions of examples. But um, one thing I just wanted to say was that um, I, I'm, I'm not going to come to you with these ideas of open source uh, as if I'm claiming to like start like a revolution in information gathering because uh, what I feel like is I'm, I'm really not. I just think it's a bit uh, too easy to feel uh, triumphant. So, um, like, what do I mean then uh, when I say it? Um, I think that openness is just like a, a shift in order and magnitude. It's like a continuation of a very long evolution in the way that knowledge is collected. And um, it's not necessarily like an overthrowing of all the established uh, practices. Um, again, I mean open very specifically as in uh, things that are designed for publishing platforms, for example, built on open source code where the license is just quite literally free. And then I also am um, using open to describe something that is just generally philosophical. So it is um, something that is used in the sense of how people might have taken code before to update it to their own use. So they look for like uh, updates or additions or further manipulations of materials in order to like enhance a pre-existing software. So I use that philosophy and uh, deal with that in publishing. So this is then one example that I'll talk to you about. This is that new design smell. It's uh, an independent uh, critical design magazine that I run out of Toronto and Amsterdam. And the way in which it operates in an open way is uh, that it um, has a bit of a strange like editorial model. It doesn't really start in one place. I'll oversimplify it by saying that it exists first as a, a discussion forum online. And the idea was to take design criticism and instead of having, you know, some guy with a black turtleneck and a shaved head kind of like lecturing you about what is good and what is bad, uh, this is just taking that whole thing and trying to like maintain the critical thinking around it, but then opening it up to a discussion forum. And so, uh, yeah, readers, visitors to the website are free to uh, share their thoughts and the contributors are engaged in order to kind of like stay there and to continue talking with them. And then we edit 
the conversation online into a printed piece. And sometimes that feeds into the events that we have. So we hold like things that vary from like stupid drunken chit chat parties to uh, like very formal Oxford style debates at larger venues. And we also have a Twitter account, which uh, the, the, the handle is just at new design smell. And we basically, um, I'll just show you a few of the things that are going on here. Um, this is the interaction design for the website. So it's just designed exclusively to kind of like, you know, make it very clear that you are here to kind of like say something. And so this is then how a story like that will come to print. The whole magazine is uh, also designed with some um, ideas in mind about like the user comments being published. So it's kind of like letter to the editor, but really a bit more uh, in, in real time. And there are three sections. Uh, one idea is to interview real designers. This is Herr Dunbar about what they think design means because people still don't seem to kind of have an answer for that question. We also talk about design in context. Uh, we have long form essays and we also have a special section where we track like really awful forms of like extreme adoration. We also track a bit of um, copy culture. This is the Twitter account, which is the funny channel. And then uh, these are some of the formal debates that we hold. And a lot of these materials will go back into the printed issues as well. Uh, this is the annual report by VPRO and um, it is in the spirit of open source. Uh, so whereas the other piece is built on WordPress, which is open source coded and has like an open editorial spin, this is really just like a, a project that um, was undertook in order to uh, do a traditional annual report for a public broadcaster. And they were in the midst of having all their funding cut and they wanted to show what kind of effect they had on their public. So we went about sourcing um, thousands of articles, uh, here is one, uh, hundreds of emails, here is one, and like feeding them into the publication so the readers could actually see. And it's full of love, some of the emails are very loving, sometimes they're very hateful. Uh, people have very strong feelings about their public broadcasters. We also tracked a lot of the, the comments online. Uh, people who name their children after some of the characters in the shows that they produce and uh, tell them about it. We also did a survey and then to kind of like break up, you know, this really text heavy moment, we uh, spread images throughout it. And by we, I mean uh, myself and Brigitte Vanderberg. And then of course it has all the traditional, you know, uh, elements of an annual report uh, in the back. Uh, and this project is a bit more true to the code idea, which is uh, it's travel.mediamatic.net. This is a social network for creatives around the world. It's built with AnyMeta, which is quite literally a free, open, licensed uh, code. And then all of the material is uh, crowdsourced, and so this is all user-generated content. Uh, here's just, you know, how the network is spread out. And then here is, for example, someone who can give you a tour of Lima. And she, like, you know, like any other social network, has a profile page. But she can also use it to publish her journals. A lot of people use it to publish their materials. We also then edited all that material into like a printing catalog, which is, you know, a bit more, I think, what we expect from travel agencies, those pretty little cheap, glossy things that we, we pick up and probably toss very quickly. Um, so Mediamatic is probably closer to A, the open source coding, and, and B, also the crowdsourced materials that were wrangled together. And this is how the like interface kind of moves along. It's a bit erratic, just like a city. It's a bit disorganized and that sort of thing. And we kept all the color black and white. Like we just decided to relax when it came to trying to kind of brand the site and that sort of thing. And we tried to be very relaxed around the order of things and how all of the framing was going to work on the site. So this is it. Thank you very much.